Hey guys, welcome to my channel on World War One modeling. Today we're going to turn this pile of plastic into the cockpit of Copper State Models' beautiful Newport 17. So, since we have a lot of work ahead, I won't lose too many words on the kit itself. But I can really tell you that it's a true champion with nice details, tight fit and great instructions. Let's start building. I do the wooden parts first as they are done with oil paints and therefore need some time to dry. The manual wants us to paint them in four different wood tones. So we better channel our inner carpenter and get going. Plywood and walnut are both relatively straightforward. I'm using the same buff base coat for both of them. And since Tamiya paints are gripping so well on plastic, I'm skipping the primer. The grain pattern itself is then done with a flat brush and a sponge. To begin with, you completely cover the part in paint. Once done, you wipe off the color with a sponge. This will leave you with a nice and regular grain pattern. Once my first run is done, I slightly dip the sponge in a darker color and pass over the part a few more times to add some more color variation. With Walnut, it's basically the same story, but we step down in our color range. For the main pattern, we now use Burnt Umber and the accent color is a dark reddish brown called Bitume. Next on the list is Poplar and Spruce. Both are brighter tones, therefore I'm mixing some pure white into the base color. If you wonder about my excessive masking, it's in place to keep the bonding surfaces nice and clean. The kit fits extremely tight and has zero love for variances. So any paint layer between bonding surfaces might cause sweat and tears in the long run. So better avoid it in the first place. The actual grain is again done with our brush sponge combo. I opted for ochre to paint the rather reddish poplar. No accent color is used here since the surface area is so small that it wouldn't really show. Spruce on the other hand is the brightest tone in our wood grain quadruple and gets a nice yellowish tone with some ochre accents. Now let's give the oils a break while we go on with the remaining interior details. Most of them sport a blue protective coat. The color goes by Bleu Horizon or Horizon Blue and the French must have been thrilled about it because they used it for virtually anything including even infantry uniforms and tank camouflage. One exception of the all blue rule is the fire protection wall that separates the engine bay and the cockpit. It's one of the more complex parts to paint because there are a lot of different colors involved. Once the primer has dried, we're good to paint the steel, aluminium and copper sections. I use Alclad colors because they are pre-thinned which makes them perfect for airbrush application. The round shapes are masked with AK masking putty. I try to work as precisely as possible here despite the fact that most of this area will be covered by the engine and its cowling later on. Normal people might shake their heads about putting so much effort into something barely visible, but I'm sure my fellow modelers will understand and appreciate it. The remaining parts are painted with a brush. Therefore I'm switching to Mr. Metal colors, which work very well for this purpose. After the paint shop has been sealed with a coat of semi-matte varnish, I'm applying some heavy weathering with oil paints. I'm starting with some dirt and fume residues. Then I'm speckling on different brown tones to simulate the stains from castor oil. The rotary engines in World War I were notorious oil spitters, virtually showering engine bays, cowlings and in some airplanes even the pilot compartment with oil. To finish the weathering, we are applying some grime in corners and around raised details where dust, dirt and oil would naturally accumulate. The backside is treated with some bright blue oil paint to distress the base coat. We can use the same color to simulate some light shipping around the edges.
Dust residues are carefully brushed and blended with Abteilung dust. So far, we were only painting single parts, but this will change now as we are finally going to put things together. We start by gluing the oil pump and the magneto to their place. Again, note how I spare all mating surfaces from paint to avoid fitting issues later on. Next, we highlight the raised rivets with a subtle pin wash. Last but not least, we speckle some more oil around because, you know, rotary engine, oil spitter, all that. Before we call it a day, we have to attach a stabilization wire between these two points. I did the rigging itself off camera, but don't worry, there's more to come in about a minute or so. With the firewall done now, we can add this air induction and finally have the first sub-assembly for our cockpit complete. Before we attach the sidewalls to the firewalls, we need to get some more fancy rigging out of the way. As you can see here, I already prepared one cross rigging section, painted and fitted with turnbuckles. And I will now show you how this is done in detail. Before we start, let's have a closer look at the turnbuckles, okay? I'm using resin turnbuckles from Gas Patch in 148 scale. I found the 133 one slightly too big and off scale, at least for the interior rigging where usually smaller turnbuckles were used. Another rigging must have our brass tubes. We'll have to squeeze a 0.1mm fishing line twice through them, so I took the tubes with 0.3mm diameter. Why 0.2 would be enough in theory, it simply doesn't work in reality. <laughs> Believe me, I tried. With the help of my super professional template here, I cut small sections from the tube. So you're ready? Okay, let's get this done. I drilled some holes in the frame to anchor the fishing line in and fix it with CA glue. I thread the fishing line first through the breast tube and then through the turnbuckle. Okay, now this is where the fun begins. We grab the end of the fishing line and thread it back through the brass tube so that it creates a loop around the turnbuckle. I'm not gonna lie, this might take you some time. If you have difficulties, try widening the tube with an old airbrush needle. Once you have done this on both sides, you can easily tighten the wires from both ends and your efforts are paid off with perfectly straight rigging and cool turnbuckles. Let's go on with some more details. This speed indicator spots a nice ripped tube. Unfortunately, the part that is to be attached is flat AF. Therefore, I am building my own tube. I take a 0.2mm wire and wind it around a 0.2mm drill bit. These drill bits are about as stable as the Russian regime in 1917, so try not to break too many. Afterwards, it's just some basic decal 101. And in the end, we are left with a beautiful speed indicator with an awesome rifle tube that sadly nobody but us will ever see once the model is done. Small heads up while I'm assembling some parts here. In my next video, I will build a plane around this cockpit, so make sure you subscribe to my channel to be notified once it's online. Looks good so far, doesn't it? Let's take it even one step further and add some light dirt and dust. I'm preparing a mix of beige and bright brown pigments. This is then stippled carefully under the paddles to represent dirt from the pilot's boots. I repeat the word carefully because these machines had rather short lifespans and simply weren't given the time to accumulate massive dust layers. The horizontal surfaces and hard to reach areas also get their fair share of dirt. Now, before we can close the construction with the left side frame, we need to address a little issue with the kit. This small part here is an oil pulsator, a glass bulb that would allow the pilot to control the oil flow. As you can see, the grey plastic misses any transparency and therefore gives a rather poor glass impersonation. 
Copper State models have noted this issue and, and provided their new Cauldron Chief Rekit with a transparent part. That doesn't really help us here, however, and we need to scratch our own one. The basis is just a piece from any transparent sprue you can get your hands on. I use a Dremel to send it to shape. The finishing touches are made with fine sandpaper and polishing paste. Here you see the left side panel fully assembled and weathered. I painted the oil level on the pulsator with some orange yellow clear paint from Tamiya. Once the panel is fixed to the construction, we can add more parts such as the control stick which I have already fitted with the control lines. After rigging and gluing the seat post, we are almost done with the heavy lifting. It still looks a bit chaotic, but this will largely improve once all the control wires are fixed and tightened. Next on our list is a cosmetic upgrade for the rear wall. I have some decals with a so-called linen weave effect from Aviatic. We will use these to pimp up the linen section of the rear wall. I create the template for the decal with masking tape. Cut the piece from the sheet and apply it like you would do with any other decal. Once dried and sealed, I'm layering on some brown and greenish shades with oil pans to simulate dirt and moist that would be soaked up by the linen. Last but not least, I'm highlighting the stitching with a yellow watercolor pencil. And then, it can finally find its place in our cockpit. We are now approaching the final stage of the build. In fact, it's mainly the seat, or to be more precise, the seat belt that is missing, so let's tackle it right now. After separating the parts, I quickly anneal them with a lighter to make them less rigid, since we need to bend them around the seat later. Instead of using a metal primer, I'm briefly bathing them in burnishing fluid. The fluid roughens up the surface which allows the paint to stick to it just as a primer would do. The assembled seat belt is then attached to the seat. I am leaving it in this position while I paint it with Vallejo and Mr. Metal colors. I am using the wet blending technique with different brown tones to create some variation in the leather. In the end, there's nothing more to do than bend down the two ends and have them hanging from the edges, like they would do in reality. With the seat and some other small parts attached to our cockpit, we can finally call it a day. So here's the final result. I am quite happy with the outcome and I hope you like it too. In the next video, we are going to build the plane around it, so make sure you subscribe to the channel to get a notification once it comes out. Also, I hereby promise that I will fix the focus issues I had in this video for the second part. Really sorry about that, but it's my first video and I'm new to filming. Anyway, see you next time!